welcome to tonight's debate. My name is Claire Parker and I am the chairman and Izzy Cuthill is the timekeeper. The adjudicator is Miss Kuo, I think. Um, and the topic of the debate is that the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. The affirmative team seated to my right is from St. Dominic's Priory College and the negative team seated to my left is from St. John's Grammar. The speaking time for this debate is six minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. A continuous bell may be rung 30 seconds after the speaking time, in which case the speaker must sit down immediately. Please switch off your mobile phones and other electronic devices. I, de I declare this debate open and call upon the first affirmative speaker, Isabella Jabel. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for our debate tonight is that the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. We define the topic as cost, meaning something lost or given, commonly amount of money, the COVID-19 pandemic as an infectious respiratory disease caused by the coronavirus which exists over a wide geographic area and typically affects a significant proportion of the population. We define worse as to be more serious, unpleasant or severe than, and the virus as the SARS-CoV-2 virus which is the infective agent causing the COVID-19 disease. These definitions were all derived from the Cambridge Dictionary and the World Health Organization. We, the affirmative team, strongly believe this statement to be true. Tonight, I'll be discussing three points. My first point will discuss the political costs of the pandemic in possibly compromising the freedom of certain citizens. My second point will look at the costs of increasing the prevalence of racism in our society. And my third and final point will discuss increased domestic violence and poor mental health. Our second speaker, Anya, will discuss the economic impacts of the pandemic on worldwide industries, which cause unemployment and governmental debt. Our third speaker, Helena, will rebut and sum up our case. My first point is that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused drastic change in the political landscape, which affects the citizens of every country, yet disproportionately affects some more than others. Over the last two years, those in government have been presented with the unprecedented task of devising COVID-19 response plans, the efficacy of which determines their re-election chances. The public have become increasingly unrestful at the state of these plans, which, according to the Washington Post, has caused a general distrust and lack of confidence in authority figures, even sparking riots. The cost of the political dynamic will affect everyone, even those who undoubtedly will not be infected by the virus, and thus is worse than the virus itself. According to foreignpolicy.com, history is full of examples of pandemics instigating political change. For example, the plague of Athens worsening the conditions of the Peloponnesian War, crumbling the foundations of Athenian democracy. Now, it is not to say that COVID-19 will be the deciding element in the fall of our political systems in Australia, yet it is undoubtedly contributing large amounts to the suppression of democracy in China. According to the Washington Post, Chinese government propaganda is using the apparent efficacy of its draconian lockdown procedures to stamp out democracy in the country and give way to authoritarianism. The myth of this authoritarian superiority in handling a lockdown has also influenced countries such as Hungary and Israel, where leaders are using the pandemic to seize power that would otherwise be undreamt of. Sonia Fenner, a political scientist studying this phenomenon, states that the misconception is dangerous and authoritarian states are actually some of the worst at managing COVID. Therefore, a side effect of this pandemic has been shifts in the political systems of certain countries, which could mean compromising the freedom of every citizen in those nations, a cost that would clearly soar way beyond mortality or infection rates. After all, when looking back on pandemics in history, we rarely recount the symptoms of the virus and rather focus on the more notable, bigger picture changes, which affect more people and for longer amounts of time. Changes in political systems and the rights of individuals as a result of COVID-19 is undoubtedly the worst effect. My second point is that the consequences of the pandemic have incited racism on a range of ethnic groups, which impacts a larger number of people than will ever be infected by the virus. According to the ABC, racial discrimination has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and is now not only being focused on the Chinese community, but other Asian communities as well. The COVID-19 Racism Incident Survey reported that 92% of victims of a racist incident felt that their experiences were related to the pandemic. Verbal slurs and physical violence are being consistently encountered by ethnic groups, and the cost of feeling unsafe or unwanted in public seems worse than possibly being infected by a virus when lockdowns and vaccines can prevent infection. 
The situation is even dire in the United States, as President Trump largely contributed to the anti-China rhetoric in making claims such as the Kung flu. Hate crimes are at their highest in over a decade in the United States, according to the BBC. Therefore, the cost of the pandemic in the form of instilling more racist ideas in the public is undeniably worse than the virus itself, as this is inescapable for targeted ethnic groups. My third and final point is that the pandemic has caused a rise in domestic violence and an overall decline in mental health, which costs unmeasurable amounts in terms of the global population's well-being. According to the ABC, domestic violence agencies were seeing both an increase in number and severity of reports over lockdown, suggesting that the pandemic has introduced the cost of safety for those who would otherwise not have been affected by the virus. The Australian Institute of Criminology revealed that almost 10% of Australian women had experienced domestic violence during the pandemic, compared to less of the population having COVID in Australia. Furthermore, the pandemic has not only affected the physical safety, but the mental health of Australians. Lifeline reported 25% more calls than at the same time the previous year, according to the ABC. Experts from Lifeline state that a third of the population have mental health concerns. Therefore, it will be harder for them to bounce back from the pandemic and lockdowns. Less than 0.25 of our population have ever been infected with COVID-19, according to the Australian government. Thus, the well-being cost of the pandemic is significantly worse for a larger number of people. After all, locking down can keep many safe from contracting the virus, but there is no vaccine or antidote against the domestic violence and mental health concerns facing millions due to the pandemic. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we, the affirmative team, strongly believe that the cost of COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. I spoke to you about the political and social costs of the pandemic and how they affect everyone more deeply and for longer than the virus infecting a smaller amount of people. As stated in The Atlantic, the virus has no mind. It is without reason and without motive. The virus in itself can simply not be worse than the vast political and social costs that come with it in our complex modern world, as it has no sense of itself or its damage. Thank you. I now call upon the first negative speaker, Alice Moody. Good evening everyone. My name is Alice and I'm the first speaker for the negative team. The topic for tonight's debate is that the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. We believe this statement to be false. We define the costs of the COVID pandemic as the global response to the pandemic COVID-19, whether it be economic, healthcare related or well-being costs. We agree with the other definitions given by the opposition. I would like to start by rebutting the arguments made by the first speaker of the opposition. The first speaker of the opposition has told you that lockdown has had a huge impact on mental health. It is undeniable the lockdown has had a huge impact on mental health. However, it is important to recognise that the rates of mental health problems were already increasing as it stands. As discussion around mental health became more normalised, more people became aware that they needed help and it's okay to seek that help. Also, if we didn't take preventative measures such as lockdown to overcome this pandemic, the rise of mental health issues would only continue to rise, having an even worse impact. Um, with the, another point that the opposition has made is about domestic violence because of COVID. With the increase in domestic violence, many new programs have been rolled out raising awareness about domestic violence. I will be talking about how the costs of the COVID pandemic are worth it as without these costs, the virus would become unregulated, resulting in far worse consequences. Our second speaker, Carpenter, will be talking about the positive effects of the, of the positive effects as a result of the cost of the pandemic. Our third speaker, Grace, will be rebutting the affirmative team's argument and summarizing our team case. The costs of COVID-19 as we know it are things such as lockdown, wearing masks, vaccinations, and other regulations. However, Without these costs, the virus would run wild, resulting in much worse costs of the pandemic. The virus, if the virus was not regulated by things such as lockdown, many more people would die. Given the 1% mortality rate of COVID-19, an estimated 70 million people globally would die from COVID-19, over twice the amount of people who would die from the current regulated virus. 
Losing 70 million people would be devastating for families, devastating for the economy, and with COVID running free, the healthcare system would be destroyed. The cost of the pandemic is undoubtedly better than the virus, as the virus could kill 70 million people, and the costs are what prevents this from happening. Now, to my first point, about the economic cost of COVID-19. While we agree that the economic cost of the pandemic is substantial, this cost is because of the lockdown and other things we have done in response to the virus. Th these responses are preventative measures to stop COVID from running wild. If people were not locked down, then the economy would suffer much more due to the lives lost from an unregulated virus. As previously mentioned, 70 million people would die from the virus if left unchecked. That is 70 million less taxpayers. That loss would be devastating to the economy, more devastating than the current economic cost of COVID. This carries on to my second point about how leaving the virus unregulated would impact the mental health of so many families. Losing loved ones is a way people have been impacted by the virus with four and a half million deaths, but so many more people will be lost if we don't put up with the costs of the pandemic. If with that many more people dying, it would be horrible for families, losing their caregivers, losing their source of income, and above all, losing their family. This would have a bigger impact on mental health than lockdown. Finally, my third point, the healthcare system. Without regulating the virus, the healthcare system would be overrun with patients and it would be too much to deal with for the doctors and nurses and their mental health and for the healthcare system in general. Hospitals would not have enough resources and equipment such as ventilators to help that many patients. Then healthcare workers would, not have, would have to make decisions on which patients they are allowed to help. Healthcare workers already have to face all of this and it has taken its toll on mental health of doctors and nurses already. In a survey taken in 2020 by frontline healthcare workers, over 70% of them reported mental exhaustion and 40% had symptoms of PTSD. This has gotten worse since then and will continue worsening until we deal with the costs of the COVID-19 pandemic and accept that they are worth it. All of this would be so much worse with the unregulated virus and this is why the costs are worth it. In conclusion, the cost of regulating the virus is clearly worthwhile, and this is what the virus is capable of. As I have said, the cost of the pandemic is undoubtedly better than the virus, as the virus could kill 70 million people and the costs prevent this from happening. Thank you. I now call upon the second affirmative speaker, Anya Arakapi. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight's debate is that the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. And we, the affirmative team, strongly agree with this statement. Our third speaker has discussed the political ramifications of the pandemic in countries such as China, costing millions of people their freedom. She also discussed the costs of the pandemic on society, such as increased racism, domestic violence, and depression rates. Tonight, as second speaker, I will discuss the extensive economic costs impacting the worldwide population through the various international industries. My second point will elaborate on how the economic ramifications of these industries as shortfalls, in addition to the massive government spending on economic support and vaccinations, has led to a significant amount of government debt, which will cost taxpayers for decades to come, far outweighing the impacts of the virus. Before I begin, there are some flaws in the opposition's argument I would like to point out. The first negative speaker said that the costs of masks and lockdowns are worth it. We are not arguing that the importance of masks, however, masks, we are not arguing the importance of masks. However, we do not believe that the total costs can be simplified to this explanation. The pandemic has cost more than the use of masks and lockdowns. It has increased domestic violence and exacerbated political tensions. The first negative speaker also discussed the economic implications of, the virus, of leaving the virus unregulated. 
and we agree. However, we would like to emphasize that the cost of these economic implications is worse than the virus itself, as I will explain further in my speech. My first point is that the pandemic has had and continues to have severe economic repercussions on a plethora of industries worldwide. These impacts have, felt, have been felt extensively throughout vital industries, such as tourism, hospitality, and education, having a, having a much farther reach than the virus itself. Travel and tourism are among the most affected sectors with facility closures and travel restrictions in virtually all countries around the world. According to Science Direct, leisure and internal tourism indicated a steep decline amounting to 2.86 trillion US dollars, which quantified more than 50% revenue losses. The World Tourism Organization released an international cost assessment, which determined that in 2020, COVID-19 caused a reduction of 1.1 billion tourists and approximately an international decrease in tourism receipts of 1.1 trillion US dollars. This is approximately a 74% fall in international tourist arrivals. The season international tourism could result in an estimated economic loss of 2 trillion US dollars in global GDP. Restricting people from spending money and injecting back to the economy what they are earning what they are earning. This fall in tourists and finances has caused unemployment in this sector to skyrocket, with according to Statistica.com, 100 million people finding themselves unemployed due to COVID-19. The hospitality sector saw a catastrophic collapse in revenue during the second quarter of 2020, with sales plummeting 87%, according to the UK Hospitality's latest quarterly tracker collated by CGA. This is specifically important because the hospitality industry accounts for 10% of the global GDP, and with such a drastic fall, the global economy was significantly affected. The education industry is also one that has faced undeserving consequences during the pandemic and is projected to have a detrimental impact on the future. The World Economic Forum states that over a billion students worldwide are unable to go to school or university due to measures to stop the spread of COVID-19. National closures kept 80% of learners out of educational institutions and another 284 million were affected by closures at a localised level. These closures will have a consequential effect on the futures of these children. When considering higher education, more than 220 million tertiary level students internationally have been affected by the pandemic, according to UNESCO. Alongside student learning inconveniences, universities are facing critical financial implications. Travel and visa restrictions have resulted in withdrawals and lower enrollment numbers among international students. In countries such as the UK, the US and Australia, many universities heavily rely on the recruitment of international students who pay higher enrollment fees than their domestic counterparts. According to Finances Online, the tourism industry employs 100 million people, the hospitality industry 212 million people, and the education industry 60 million teachers educating 1.5 billion students worldwide. In comparison, there have been 219 million death cases of COVID reported with 4.5 million deaths. When comparing case and death numbers to the numbers of people impacted by economic ramifications of the pandemic, it is clear that the number lies in the latter. Therefore, the cost of the pandemic is worse than the virus itself. My second point is how the economic ramifications of these industries' shortfalls, coupled with massive government spending on economic support and vaccinations, has led to significant amounts of governmental debt. During the early stages of the pandemic, the World Bank predicted a worldwide recession, the likes of which have not been seen since World War II. Like a virus, this severe economic recession infects many facets of daily life around the world. Due to these substantial impacts, governments were inclined to spend money implementing lockdowns purchasing and distributing vaccines and providing support payments for the unemployed. The International Money Fund has estimated that the final bill for the pandemic will total to $28 trillion in lost output. The investment in vaccines has been essential for countries internationally as an attempt to return to pre-pandemic life. <coughs> Governments would have to collectively spend $316 billion, assuming that the average cost of, a, of the vaccine is $40 per person. Regarding distributions, if advanced economies continue to prioritize vaccination as their susceptible populations without ensuring equitable vaccination for developing economies, the total cost of the world would vary between 1.5 to 9.2 tr trillion US dollars. 
Additionally, governments are spending on the economic support primarily through welfare initiatives. The Parliament of South Australia, I'd like to go on, but thank you for listening. <laughs> I now call upon the second negative speaker, Grace Jennings. Carl for Carl, um, Robinwood. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kafka Ramanathan, and the motion for tonight's debate is that the cost of COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. As the opposition team, we believe the statement to be false. I would like to start by rebutting some of the affirmative team's points. The first speaker of the affirmative team said that mental health has declined because of COVID-19. We understand that mental health is an issue. However, when globally prioritizing lives versus mental health in the short term, saving lives has been seen to be more important. However, with the rapid push to increase the vaccination rate, we will pass through this phase and start having people socializing and improving mental health again. The second speaker of the affirmative team also talked about the large amounts of government debt that COVID will leave. However, you can't put a price on lives lost from the virus. Lives are a worse cost than the economic crisis that can be recovered from. Not only this, the economic impact of COVID-19 is not the worst we have faced. And with the government programs such as JobKeeper being rolled out along with JobSeeker, many businesses and individuals have been able to adapt with 80% of recipients making a profit. The world has recovered from worse economic states and it can also recover from this. The second speaker of the affirmative team also talked about how COVID has an impact on students. However, closing schools is a, we agree that closing schools is difficult to put up with. However, the, students affected, the, the number of students affected by online learning would actually be more affected by COVID. If, kept, if we kept schools open, COVID would spread, resulting in more deaths. Our first speaker, Alice, has already talked about how the COVID-19 pandemic is worth it, as without these costs, the virus would become unregulated, resulting in far worse consequences. As the second negative speaker, I will be talking about the positive effects as a result of the costs of the COVID pandemic. Every year, 600,000 Americans die of cancer which is two times the death rate from the COVID coronavirus. But what if coronaviruses, coronavirus has aided in the treatment of diseases such as cancer and HIV and made vaccine discovery and production much more efficient and quicker? Although the previous statement downplays the current virus's severity, it does highlight the significant breakthroughs in medical technology and research that have occurred as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has significantly helped bring the world together in global research and rapidly expanded the capabilities across the world to produce multiple safe vaccines. The Oxford University AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine technology is also being used to make cancer vaccines. For decades, scientists have assumed that a certain mechanism for delivering vaccines would be beneficial. Large infections such as HIV were difficult to treat before coronavirus. However, the development of testing coronavirus has changed everything, says Tom Evans, Vaxi Tech's chief scientific officer. The finding of vaccinations for illnesses such as HIV and cancer have been fueled by the outbreak of the virus. To tie it in with our team's definition, the development of medical technology and research is a good consequence from the COVID-19 pandemic. Government policies during the COVID-19 pandemic affected global energy demand patterns dramatically. Many international borders were closed and people were confined to their homes in lockdown and transportation was limited. But by early April in 2020, 
the daily worldwide carbon dioxide emissions had fallen by 17% compared to an average rate in 2019, with, little on, well, with only little under half of the reduction of both international and local travel and surface transportation. In addition, individual countries, including the world's biggest emitters, such as the US, China and India's emissions, fell by an average of 26% at their peak, according to carbonbrief.org. The coronavirus has unknowingly given us the opportunity to repair some of the damage that we have caused to the planet and reduce global carbon emissions for the future. It would continue to impact the decisions we make into the future regarding global consumption and allow us to turn to more sustainable alternatives. The pandemic was controlled solely by public health measures before any of the vaccines became available. This leads me to my final point, ladies and gentlemen, that the global, that the global COVID-19 pandemic has taught people in the world the significance of safety and sanitization. A year of hand washing, cleaning, and disinfecting our homes, schools, and healthcare facilities has taught us all as individuals, households, and a society the vital role that hygiene and safety plays in the fight against an infectious disease like COVID-19. We have made significant leaps towards the Sustainable Development Goal, General Sanitation for All Act, and globally, we have progressed in making sanitation available and accessible to all. Following the lead of China, when wearing masks and sanitation are daily practices as they have already experienced viruses such as the bird flu and porcine pest virus. China has had a quick response to the pandemic, allowing them to easily control the number of cases. Other countries, like Australia, were able to also quickly introduce restrictions. While other countries, like India and Zimbabwe, have given more attention to safety and hygiene restrictions. Sailesh Gupta, blogger and Indian entrepreneur, states that India now has a higher level of hand soaps, masks and sanitizers, and availability of clean water, ensuring the safety of its population. While communities in Zimbabwe are coming together and have made over a thousand local hand washing stations with their own funds, and 94% of stations are constantly being used for regular hand washing. The COVID pandemic has presented us with an opportunity to establish safer environments and make them cleaner and safer for all. The cost of COVID will help us in the future when other global pandemics take place. I would love to go on, but unfortunately, my time is up. I now call upon the third affirmative speaker, Helena Nguyen. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight's debate is that the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. We, the affirmative team, agree with this statement. Tonight's third speaker, I'll be rebutting the negative team's case and summarizing my team's points. The first negative speaker stated that raising awareness for domestic violence, depression and other mental health disorders will resolve the problem. However, it simply does not change and cannot be compared to the amount of damage initially caused. Yes, we can move forward and bounce back. However, it will take multiple years and even decades before we get the world's well-being to be at where it previously was. Support, support services may have been enforced to alleviate mental issues regarding lockdowns. However, it does not deter from the fact that people are suffering and will continue to suffer during this pandemic. Although some have been benefit, benefiting from government initiatives, others have taken advantage of situations such as job seeker to retain profits for themselves. A prime example is Harvey Norman, who was given $22 million in JobKeeper, despite profiting more than $462 million during the pandemic. At a time in which 1 million Australians are out of work, taxpayers should not be supporting well-off companies. The first negative speaker has listed the statistics on deaths for COVID-19 
However, this is not conclusive evidence to prove that the virus is worse than the cost of the pandemic. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, although the number of COVID deaths in Australia are increasing by the day, a common factor is that most of the deaths fall within the age groups of 70 plus, with 209 male deaths from 80 to 89 and 208 female deaths from 90 plus. A study conducted by the Australian government proved that these deaths were all triggered as a result of underlying health issues, a common occurrence for the elderly. Hence, this concluded that the virus itself is not deadly, but instead revealed that underlying conditions are in fact the major contributing factor to higher mortality rates regarding COVID-19. The speaker has also claimed that the economic impacts of COVID is something the world can recover from, but death is not. However, where there is death, there is also births. Yes, losing a life, a life is terrible, but there will always be another to replace it. According to our world in data, in 2020, approximately 139.98 million babies were born. In comparison to the amount of deaths, 60.12 million, it is evident that one factor outweighs another. Even if we were to presumably add another 20 million deaths from COVID, the number of deaths is still significantly lower than the amount of births. On the other hand, economic effects can be detrimental for future generations, as our speaker has spoken about. As of now, the world population today is currently around 7.7 .7 billion. Nevertheless, a source from the ABC states that if us humans want to continue living as we do with a good sustainable environment, the number of humans Earth can sustain long term is only around 1.9 billion people, roughly the global population 100 years ago in 1919. As heard, the world is already heavily overpopulated to the point that, that the amount of deaths contracted from COVID-19 is still not enough to get under the estimated number. Hence, the amount of deaths is not an aspect which should be focused on, but instead the economic impacts which will last for decades to come. Another aspect to this point could be the comparison to previous viruses. According to Vox.com, COVID-19 is the ninth deadliest virus in history, with the Black Plague placing first, followed by the Spanish influenza. The Black Plague, which occurred from 1346 to 1352, took nearly 80 years for population sizes to recover. 70, uh, 700 years on, with improved technology and proper education regarding the virus, there is no doubt that the population will be able to recover, especially as there are significantly less deaths compared to the viruses before. On the other hand, the recovery of the economy is one that will take years to mend, as our second speaker has spoken about, which will create a lasting effect on the world's development. The second speaker has claimed that this pandemic has in fact brought communities together. However, this is simply incorrect. The pandemic has done the complete opposite, as stated in our first speaker's point, where the amounts of racism and xenophobia towards Asian countries have increased. How exactly has this pandemic brought people together when there are people referring to this as the Chinese virus? Ultimately, this pandemic has revealed that countries are only looking out for themselves for the most part. From the vaccine discussion, where countries debated on who the vaccine should go towards first, without any consideration for those developing countries hit hardest, proves that countries do not have another's best interests at heart. The second speaker has said that the cost of the pandemic can be justified as even, though men as even though mental health is impacted, this is less deadly than the virus. However, this is incorrect, as keeping a stable economy has in fact been proven to save lives. The Great Depression is a prime example when the US stock market crash brought hardship, homelessness, unemployment and hunger to millions of people. As a result of the declining economy, this prompted suicide rates to rise more than 30%, with people being so demoralised by hard times that they lost their will to live. The speaker has also claimed that the world, despite facing initial loss, has actually benefited from the pandemic. Although the economy has bounced back, the global GDP projections from October 2019 to April 2021 has dropped by 10. This could take years and years, uh, years and years to recover from, impacting future generations, as a drop in GDP growth shows that the economy is shrinking, meaning that no income is being made, implying that we, the future generations, will have to work twice as harder to compensate for the loss and return to pre-pandemic trajectories. Tonight, our first speaker, Isabella, spoke to you regarding the social cost of the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the mental well-being of people as a result of prolonged lockdowns and the racism and, ex and abuse experienced by targeted ethnic groups. She also covered the political cost, with countries and rebel forces using this pandemic to their advantage as a form of propaganda to achieve their goals of exploiting and influencing others. Our second speaker, Anya, spoke to you regarding the impacts on different sectors as a result of COVID-19 and also spoke about the debt our generation will have to cover as a result of government funds introduced throughout COVID. 
In conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we, the affirmative team, strongly believe that the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. COVID-19 has, has had a detrimental impact on everyone. There is no doubt about that. However, the economic, social and political effects are ones that will influence the world's evolving future, creating deep-rooted problems for future generations. Thank you. I now call upon the third negative speaker, Grace Jennings. Good evening, honoured guests, chairperson and timekeeper. My name is Grace and I'm the third and final speaker for the negative team and the final speaker for tonight's debate. The topic for this debate is that the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is worse than the virus. As the negative team, we believe this statement to be false. As third speaker, I will write the affirmative team's case before summarising our team's debate. The first affirmative speaker spoke about mental health and especially the impact lockdown has had on mental health. It is undeniable that, there had, that lockdown has had a huge impact on mental health, however it is important to recognise that the rates of mental health problems were already increasing as it stands. As discussion around mental health became normalised, more people became aware that they might need help. The destigmatising of mental health issues also encouraged more people and gave them confidence to share their stories. This is not to say that COVID has not had an impact on mental health. It has, but it's to recognise that, that we were already increasing in rates. Also, if we didn't take preventative measures such as lockdown to overcome this pandemic, the rise of mental health issues would only continue to rise, having an even worse impact. Because not only would people be dealing with the impacts of being in a long-term state of fear and stress, but so many more would be grieving an approximated 70 million deaths that would occur. The impacts of COVID on mental health would be so much worse if we didn't take preventative measures and costs such as lockdowns to stop the spread. The affirmative second speaker has told you that the economic impacts of COVID is worse than the virus. However, this is not the case. Through government initiatives such as JobKeeper, which support businesses by providing them with extra financial support, they can stay open and subsequently keep more employees. In fact, according to the ABC, many companies have made a profit. The vast bulk of recipients, 88% of them, so roughly 8,800,000 ,8 businesses, were making a profit. Even more astounding, a little over half were doing better than the previous year. But they kept receiving wage subsidies, which helped lifted earnings by an average 20%. All these businesses met the requirements laid out by the government to become eligible for JobKeeper. So while many think the economy, especially in relation to businesses, is near unrecoverable, precedents such as the economic recovery after the Great Depression an early 90s recession, which had higher unemployment rates at 11.20% than last year's peak unemployment rate, 6.2% in Australia, show us that this is untrue. These statistics affirm the fact that while the economy has suffered with right programs, it can recover and return to its pre-COVID state, maybe even better. Every year, people pay an emergency tax fee, which the government can use and will continue to use. Governments will and always be in debt, and there are many ways in which this can be overcome. But until then, we must prioritise lives over money. The economic cost is nothing compared to the cost of the loss of lives. The third speaker also said that underlying health issues are the main cause behind COVID deaths. However, those lives would not have been lost at this time in this capacity if it weren't for the virus. Finally, to summarise, Alice, our first speaker, spoke to you about how without some costs, the virus would be left near uncontrolled, resulting in terrible consequences. She discussed the fact that an estimated 70 million people would die if the virus was left unregulated and how the economy, healthcare system and people's state of mental health would only decrease further if we didn't have any costs. Our second speaker, Carbiger, continued on with our case by pointing out the fact that without COVID-19, the technology created to find the vaccine would not be able to be used to help other, cure other diseases and illnesses, diseases which kill millions of people combined every year. She also talked about how the cost of going into lockdown decreased the total carbon dioxide emissions and gave the planet a chance to start recovery while improving air quality and subsequently decreased the mental, uh, medical issues many experience due to bad air quality. Furthermore, she talked about how the habits which will continue from this pandemic 
including mask wearing and more frequent sanitation, allow people to live in a safer environment and decrease chances of getting sick, something which can play out to protect more vulnerable members of the community for many, many years to come. So before we conclude the debate, I ask you this. Are the costs aided, all of which are experienced to regulate the virus, not worth it, even if it means saving a life? The cost of the COVID-19 pandemic is not worse than the virus, and you can't put a price on a life. Thank you. We have now come to question time. For the next three minutes, teams are invited to take turns to ask each other questions about the debate. That is, the affirmative team will ask a question, and the negative team, then the affirmative team, and so on. A team is free to indicate if it has no questions. I now invite the affirmative team to ask its first question. So something that we both discussed was the economic implications of COVID-19 in the sense. And the way I'm seeing it is you're saying that all these economic, thing, or economic implications are worth it because they're protecting us from the virus. Am I correct to say that? Uh, when we were talking about the protections from the virus, we were more referring to lockdowns and like regulations. But a lot of the, the lockdowns and regulations do have an impact on the economy. So the, when you say like the economic impact of the virus in terms of in terms of like lockdown, because lockdown costs a lot for businesses and stuff, that kind of thing um, is an impact on the economy and it is preventing the virus from getting worse. And that's exactly where I became confused because we were discussing exactly that. We believe that the costs brought on by such things such as lockdown, such as closure of businesses, impacts on tourism, hospitality, education, they're all significantly affecting more people worse than having have contracted the virus. And by stating what you just said, you're agreeing with us. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, <laughs> so, so the virus um, so the costs of the virus in terms of the economy and lockdown, those costs are worth it and they're not worse than the virus because the virus could, like, it could do so much worse if it wasn't for those costs. Um, our argument and the debate is not trying to justify the cost, it's saying that the costs are actually worse. So if you think about it, the harm to the economy impacts every single person. In our case, we discussed that we haven't actually had that many cases in Australia, so the economic impacts will actually affect everyone. They'll affect our generation because we're going to be paying off JobKeeper for so many years to come. Yeah, but without, without those costs, the virus would become unregulated and worse, and that would be worse for the economy, that would be worse for mental health, and that would make the costs worse. Yeah, I sort of get what you're saying. Yeah, you go. What it is, is we're not arguing that the costs aren't worth it. We're simply saying that the impact of these costs are worse than having, contract, having the virus. Because if you look at the results, 219 million people were affected out of a population of 7.9 billion. However, that population of 7.9 billion were all affected by the economic, social, and political implications. Therefore, we believe that they are worse than the virus itself. So the... <laughs> I just keep going back and forth. Yeah, it's so good. we've got a question. You're yeah, we, we might have a question now, if you want. Anyone else? <laughs> um, just with your argument about um, discussing how employment has reduced because of COVID-19 and how businesses such as hospitality and tourism has dropped, but we also recognise that businesses such as um, Zoom and Skype and all these new technological advances have actually improved such a business and an industry. Um, and we did mention that in our debate. Because I know. <laughs> no, definitely, they have increased, and we're not denying that. But we can also assume that without COVID, these technological industries would have increased anyway, because moving into the future, we're becoming more technologically dependent. Do we agree with that? Agreed, but um, I feel like we've had a more rapid increase of technological development. Like, um, without COVID, this increase would have been slow, and... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, while the adjudicator finalises the results, I will read this evening's chairman's notices. So, we are delighted to announce that subject to COVID restrictions, the grand finals will be held in the House of Assembly Chamber, Parliament House, on Saturday the 25th of Dece September 2021. There will likely be a need to RSVP for contact um, tracing purposes, so please keep an eye out for this information. 
Year 10 and senior, would you like to be an adjudicator for primary school debates in 2022? Adjudicating is great community service and it will help to improve your own debating. See the information desk for more information about how to sign up. Topic and site information for the semi-finals will be available on Debating SA website from tomorrow morning. Please be sure to check your site and debate time information carefully. Debates will be held here at the same venue next week. I now invite the adjudicator, Ms. Chaw, forward. Thank you. First of all, a huge, oh, I'll take this off. A huge congratulations to both teams for tonight's debate and for making it to the quarterfinals. Two really strong teams tonight, and I hope you thoroughly enjoyed researching the topic. Um, starting with Isabella. Uh, your definition was really well done, very complete, and you explained, you know, that when you're talking about cost, you're mainly exploring um, that regarding money rather than other types of costs. Overall, your speech was very well structured, and I thought you completely fulfilled your role as a first speaker, so really good job. You split up your arguments into three clearly defined topics. They were explored well and you definitely showed a lot of research. Overall, there isn't much feedback for you as it was a well prepared speech and that's the main thing you wanted to be sure of as you know you have no rebuttals, you have that full speech to prepare and you definitely took full advantage of that. Well done. We've got Alice starting for the negative team. Um, starting with the, um, the definition, you did clarify the definition of costs. Um, you said that your team would be, you know, addressing it as a global response. I thought with that you could have ex expanded upon that definition just to you know, make it more clear to the audience. Because once you started your first argument, that definition definitely became clear as to what you guys were referring to. But just a few more sentences at that very beginning would improve that. With your rebuttal, you raised really relevant points against the opposition. My only piece of feedback would just be to expand upon them and include evidence where possible. For example, um, when you were explaining how mental health, that those statistics were already rising due to, you know, the increase of the breakdown of the stigma, so that would increase the amount of reports. And because it seemed like it was an argument you guys had prepared also, as it was brought up again in the third speaker's speech, definitely note down the source of where you got that information from. Your arguments were really relevant. You. I really liked how you clearly broke down the various costs and then justified them in a really structured manner. You explained how these costs were worthwhile and you made that really clear to the audience. My only piece of feedback would just to expand upon each one of those arguments a bit more so it does have that substance. Um, your speech uh, did fall short by a minute so making sure you make full use of that time would be better. Well done, Alice. And now we've got Anya. With your rebuttal, some feedback with that would to give some of your arguments right there in the rebuttal, addressing the opposition's points. You did address them by saying you will explain some of these arguments later on in the speech. And while you are able to do that, it would be much stronger if you did provide those arguments in rebuttal and then expand even more later on, but making sure there is some sub substance there. With your arguments, your first topic about all the industries being affected, that was explored thoroughly. You, you know, went into the various industries like education, tourism, and explained the impact. With this one, just make sure that, you know, throughout that topic itself, link back to the topic sentence a bit more frequently, just to emphasize that relevance. Um, as, you know, 
it was a lot of explanation, so we don't want the audience to get lost and just bringing it back to the topic will let us know that what you're talking about actually ties to the topic, yeah, really well. Um, it was just a little disappointing that we didn't get to hear the rest of your second topic, as it would have been good to see you explore a separate idea there. Presentation-wise, you spoke really well with strong clarity, so it was great to see you demonstrate your strong presentation skills. Well done, Anya. <laughs> and now we've got Karpaha. I thought you raised lots of good points in your rebuttal and also good to see you address so many of the opposition's points. That was really well done. Moving on to your arguments, I like the wide variety of arguments and I thought they were quite creative ideas that you brought up. Um, you know, you talked about all the medical breakthroughs that were a result of the pandemic and how, you know, it did have a positive effect on that, as well as, you know, other positive habits that, you know, were yeah, generated from this pandemic, especially regarding hygiene. So that was a really good point made. Overall, I thought that the creativity was strong in your speech and you were a standout speaker and yeah, presentation wise too, that was really engaging and overall, you were a strong team member who presented lots of valuable points, so really good job. <laughs> now closing up for the affirmative team, Helena. First of all, lots of rebuttals. So great to see that you did attempt most of the opposition's points. Um, some really relevant and well-reasoned arguments presented. Some of them were weaker than others, but that is to be expected. For example, you did bring up a point about how, you know, with the amount of births that this would replace the lives taken. Uh, I didn't believe that was the strongest point but you did go on to explore other topics that were really strong. You mainly explored the economic factors in your throughout your rebuttal, and while that was good, um, it would have been better for you to explore other topics also, just for a bit more variety. Uh, you did bring up one point claiming that the opposition said that the pandemic brought communities together. I'm not quite sure if they raised that, but I could be mistaken. Presentation wise, just make sure you are engaging with the audience with eye contact. It can be difficult, you know, with your speech being mostly made up of rebuttals, which you would have prepared only tonight, but just attempting to connect with the audience with eye contact would elevate your speech. Overall, great to see that you spent most of your time on rebuttal and kept that conclusion very short. Great job. <laughs> and last but not least, we've got Grace. A wonderful start with your rebuttal. Your first point against the opposition's point about mental health and the impacts of lockdown. That was explored really well. You, again, brought up the same point as your first speaker but then explained it a little bit more and added to that so very strong reasoning there as well as you addressing the economic impacts you explored you know government support and how this had a positive impact on a lot of companies it would have been good for you to also explore the opposition's claim about how some of these companies have been exploiting these subsidies so addressing that rebuttal would strengthen that point more. You did need much more rebuttal, so a, about three or four well-explained rebuttal would increase the length of your speech as it did fall short. But summary-wise, that was really well prepared and great that you kept it concise. You close up your team case really well. Well done, Grace. It was ex an extremely close debate tonight. Again, two extremely strong teams. And it's incredible that you made it here and I hope you go home feeling really proud because you definitely 
yeah, deserve to be here tonight. The winning team of tonight's debate um, showed greater depth and exploration with their arguments, and that team is the affirmative team. Well done. Well done to both teams once again, and the debater award goes to the second speaker, Carl Pagan. Well done. I call upon a member of the runner-up team to give a vote of thanks. Um, we'd like to thank um, everyone for coming to watch the adjudicator, chairman and timekeeper. Thanks for your position for putting up a good debate and well done. Um, thank you to my team lead and well done everyone. <laughs> I call upon a member of the winning team to second that vote of thanks. So seconding that vote of thanks, we want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and supporting us. It's always great to present to an audience. Thank you to the adjudicator for giving us that excellent feedback. We'll definitely use it for our next debate. And thank you, you guys for putting up such a strong fight. We are so nervous and smart and silly and just feel ashamed here. Thank you to the chairman and timekeeper because we've organised this debate and it can't run without you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. I now declare this debate closed. Thank you.